But anyway, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, Matt. How do I pronounce your full name? Oh, Matthew Santon Rutherford. So my partner and I had a commitment ceremony 15 years ago and we decided we'd join out their names. Oh. This seemed like a good idea at the time, but it takes forever to sign shit and fill out forms. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, I guess that's a bit of a trend, uh, having hyphenated surnames uh, <laughs> these days, but I just couldn't imagine, you know, having to sign everything these days, um, with, with that, but, oh, well, I guess that's, uh, a price to pay. with it now, really. <laughs> uh, well, with the, with the legal system, you can always change your name to whatever you want it to be these days, but yeah, yeah. yeah if you could pick any name, what name would you go by? Oh, um. Yeah, something much shorter. I've always had a long name. Yeah. Matthew Rutherford is, is just is long. Um, and even getting people to understand that had been a struggle. So something shorter, you know, I might even go something a bit more nondescript. Um, uh, my um, uh, alternative name, if I was going to be a girl, I was going to be called Bernadette. Okay. Uh, other names were considered Luke. And uh, I thought there was a Luke Rutherford running around having a better time than I was. And I worked for Commonwealth Bank for a while. And there was a Luke Rutherford working in Launceston. I thought that probably isn't the one I'm thinking about. Um, so I'm thinking maybe Luke, Luke Smith or something, Luke, you know, Luke something. Okay. Yeah. Something um, shorter. And can you give us a bit of an overview of your career so far? Uh, yep, I started in testing in 1998 for Y2K, where just about anybody could get a testing job in if they just had one head. Um, and then I've been in, worked, so worked in software testing for over 20 years and the last 10, 12 years in leadership roles. Um, I guess mostly in the finance industry, but also in tele telecommunications. And I worked for the uh, for transport for the railways for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and what... Uh, when you, uh, I guess, started for the for the Y2K bug, uh, I've actually got a blog post of the the new Y2K bug that's coming up in 2035, uh, mm -hmm. when the 32-bit uh, timer uh, overflows. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the main um, challenges or considerations trying to get systems up to date with the Y2K bug back in 2000? The main consideration. You know, there was a huge amounts of money spent. Um, and in today's eyes, people probably think, oh, that was money wasted. But there was a real concern that um, systems would stop operating. People, interest would be charged incorrectly. And our planes might fall out of the sky once. I'm not sure how true that is. But really, no one wanted to be sued. Mm. So the, the whole point was not to be sued. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think there was a really good, um, some of the issues were, you know, some systems didn't have proper test environments. I did some uh, testing on the satellite system for um, Optus and had to speci <coughs> excuse me, specify a test environment. So that was quite interesting, working with satellite TV. Yep. You know, the main challenge was basically this massive regression test based around dates. Oh, and making sure your system could move, move dates. So I was... Um, working in an environment where you could easily move the date and I went to other environments where you could easily move the date and this is so useful for so many different things mm. and then I turned up at my at a recent employer and I went, right so how do I change the date on the mainframe oh no we can't do that but they'd started this mainframe would come into existence after Y2K so they mm. yeah yeah a big deal. but some of the tools that I'd taken for granted were not necessarily everywhere yeah um, for anyone who's joined the, the live stream, just to give you a bit of background, uh, if you haven't been working in tech for 20 years like Matt has and didn't work through the Y2K bug, uh, the issue with the, just a bit of background context, was that when the, if you had a two-bit counter for your uh, year, so when you went from 1999, if you only represented it, it as a, a two-digit number as 99, when you rolled over to the new millennia, uh, year 2000, was it year zero zero nineteen zero zero or would it be year 100 or there were there were concerns that uh, this rollover was going to cause a lot of issues it was more of an issue for uh, systems that counted numbers or only used a, a two-digit number to to restrict memory use so generally old legacy systems mm -hmm. they actually had one of these y2k bugs impact the finance system in 1979 when they first built when they were still building 
banking platforms, um, this system had been built for four or five years, but only used a single digit to represent the year. So when when the year rolled over from uh, 1979 to 1980. Uh, all of a sudden systems got their knickers in a twist, a lot of bugs tend to happen, you can have finance miscalculations and uh, if you don't accommodate for some of these things. Um, Y2K uh, helped drive a lot of outsourcing to, to India. I think the Y2K bug really established uh, India as the tech hub that it is uh, today mm. um, because they had um, a lot of a lot of the US old technology was exported to India while they were going through development. So they had access to all of these old mainframe systems where all of these old bugs were. And they had relatively cheap labor compared to the US. And uh, a whole bunch of people who had gone through uni uh, learning these old mainframe techs because it was um, old export technology from, from the US too. Uh, so it uh, was an interesting time, I think, in the in the tech timeline, and I wasn't calling myself a tester then, but it's uh, definitely interesting to read up on some of the history. Uh, did you uh, catch the uh, Y2K recipe book? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, there, was, uh, there was an old uh, recipe book for how to cook if, like, all your technology just failed. Oh, right. <laughs> Is that a barbecue? Oh, maybe. And I guess we're, we're experiencing a similar issue now where it's how to cook during a pandemic when you can't buy things at the supermarket, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you, uh, are you well stocked up on uh, toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> it's a question on everybody's lips, isn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, um, uh, uh, we found some two weeks ago, but I think that we'll have to add it to the shopping list today and pray to the toilet paper gods there are some in stock. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's getting a bit... Tight in some households with the, <laughs> and also with us, you know, everyone being home all the time. I'm using we're using more than you normally would. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, what uh, can you tell a bit about your uh, current role? You've uh, been in that role for a week or two now. Yeah, that's right. So um, I wouldn't recommend changing jobs in a pandemic and starting an, <laughs> a new job when nobody's in the office. This has been quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, and also because nobody. <laughs> Nobody really wants to talk to you. They're too busy dealing with the situation at hand. So um, I turn up and my boss is there the first day um, and he's dealing with, and the whole team dealing with, you know, projects that are starting, uh, are stopping really or slowing down and rebalancing uh, resources. And there's also a vendor, an offshore vendor involved. So um, what's happening with that, slowing them down or getting rid of some of them off the, off the account. Um, and so we had some face-to-face -face time on that first day, but not much. And then I was in the office for another couple of days while I got remote access sorted out. Of course, getting onto the help desk during a pandemic, also not easy. Um, but I did manage to lock my laptop in a drawer on the first day. So uh, nobody saw me get the locksmith to my desk on the second day. So that was an advantage. <laughs> not what I'd recommend. Yeah. Um, and then by Thursday, I was working from home. And, uh, and then by then, uh, my manager was focused on the the the, um, the company's decided how many people can we get to take leave. So we we're slowing we're kind of how you know how many of the contractors or fixed term people can we finish or you know make sure we've got end dates for and then other permanent staff. Um, how many have got leave and how many, you know, who can we get to take leave? If you're on a critical project, the rule is two weeks, but if you're non-critical, then it's four weeks. Over the next eight weeks, they're kind of taking us up to the end of the financial year. So. Um, I have not been the center of attention and I'm struggling with that. <laughs> what was the, um, uh, main, um, motivation or inspiration for changing roles at the time? Was, were you looking for a new challenge? Um, I found that consulting wasn't for me. Okay. And, and that, um, I, I work better when I'm, you know, working with other testers, um, that I can, I don't know. It's not only learn from, but it's kind of just get uh, inspiration from or energy from, I guess. Mm. And, being, and being pushed out to client science to kind of deal by myself, I found I wasn't thriving in that situation. And the project I, I was on, I was finding particularly challenging and I didn't really have much support. Um, and that was a contributor as well. Yeah, no, it, it, I've heard it can be challenging being shelved client side. Well, actually, I have that experience being shelved client side and just 
trying to figure and add value, but there's just extra corporate um, structures in place that even that make it just harder just to collaborate with people too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's some ideas that I had to um, increase collaboration um, uh, were accepted, and some you know we couldn't do because of budgetary reasons. With and you know with no kind of further discussion about that. Um, in the end, it ended up being a values clash. Mm. Um, we're having some microphone feedback, I think, on on your side. Mm -hmm. Can I turn down the game there? Uh, do you want to just quickly try leaving and uh, uh, re-entering the, the room again? That seemed to fix the last problem. Sure, I'll give it a go. Cool, thank you. Uh, and if you have uh, any questions while we go through this interview, uh, you're more than welcome to pop them in the Twitch channel and we will uh, answer any questions at the end while we're, while we're just trying to figure out this uh, if we're having any tech problems at the moment. And I uh, apologize if you can hear a noisy fan from my PC in the background. Oh, there we go. Are we, are we back? Okay, I'm back. Oh, yes, that's 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 helped. That's fixed the, the microphone problem we were having. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so a lack of support in the work environment. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I think it's probably more of a, a cultural thing. I mean, that's the consultant's job is to go to go to a client site you know and make it work mm. um you know that probably wasn't my strength i found mm. i find um i imagine that um being client side you also if you're in that consultant role have to practice more of your sales skills uh uh yeah yeah and um the, the, that was certainly an expect expectation that i don't think i fully understood when i started um and probably something i wasn't that good at either yeah, I find it. Um, uh, well, testers are generally so absorbed with trying to find issues in software uh, that it can be really hard to switch into sales mode where you're just trying to praise how the uh, how the how the software is meant to live up to people's expectations too. Uh, yeah, too busy doing the job rather than to sell the next job. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's uh, I guess the the testers' mindset is trying to uh, uh, demist or try to break assumptions in um, in software um, as opposed to just build them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, I certainly had, I, I did go to some interesting clients and I learned a lot about how to, you know, I went to one, uh, went to one particular client where I was actually in a, a quality coaching role mm -hmm. and I learned a lot there about, um, you know, giving giving ideas out and getting feedback about those ideas and you know when those ideas don't work uh to change those ideas mm -hmm. so i had a great idea about traceability and you know the testers i was working with were going yeah matt we're not doing that <laughs> right well let's find something else then yeah. and more actually and becoming that required a much more collaborative approach yeah mm. so that was yeah so i learned an important thing there yeah There's the yeah meet the team where they are yeah, that seems like some, some good advice out there. Um, has, has there been any other challenges in your career recently that come to mind? Um, so my, my, uh, the role before this, role before the consultancy was at IAG and that had restructured and I was a quality coach there. And this was an idea from the CIO, CIO at the time where IT was moved into um teams like the more like the spotify model so before we had uh, development teams kind of assigned to their applications bas and testers and they were assigned to bau or projects as required and work with project managers and this new structure was bas and the testers would move in with the developers and they would have their own uh, team to do you know deliver on their backlog of work and then that backlog would come from bau and production and our uh, projects and so on so uh, the BAs and uh, tester teams and even PM team kind of dissolved and the uh, guilds were set up as a way to support that community. 
um, which seemed like a great idea, um, didn't really, I think uh, what I learned was how important it was um, for your executive sponsor to still be in the role if you want that position to continue. So when she left, it kind of disintegrated. Um, and also meet your own, again, meet with the team where they were. So this idea that people would um, engage their learning, learning mindset, learning mindset and take time out of their work day to, you know, contribute to the community and contribute to their own learning. That's not what they wanted. And we were a long way from that when we started. And that would take years to get to rather than maybe the six or 12 months that we had in mind. Yeah. So some, some groups were probably more in that than the others, you know, and also the testing team had uh, a lot of vendor staff and really they're not that interested and it's not their priorities either. So, you know, there's kind of like a number of conflicting things that we weren't taking into account when trying to develop that. And just looking back now, I can see that we were trying to give them something that they didn't want mm -hmm. rather than going, well, what do you want yep. than that, which is where we should have started from. Yeah. Okay. Again, meeting the team where they are. <laughs> <laughs> might, might be a bit of a theme with today's interview. Might be a theme, yeah. yeah. Um, so for um, anyone who hasn't heard the term quality coach before, do you mind just quickly describing what that role entails from your point of view and experiences? Uh, yeah, from my experience, it's been uh, going into a testing team or development group and looking at the testing practice and seeing how that can be um, improved to give uh, the outcome that the team need. So do they need um, traceability, auditability for their organization? Do they need less defects in production? Um, do they need a way to communicate what they're doing to other stakeholders? Um, it depends what questions you need answered from your particular coaching effort. You know, there is a lot of ways, different ways to do testing. And, you know, this still needs to be done productively. Um, and same place I was doing quality coaching, it was also talking about implementing automation. We had somebody from my consultancy doing automation and trying to upskill the testers, the manual testers to do that. But even though we kind of laid out this roadmap, the benefit of laying out the roadmap was that after about six weeks, we went, all oh, right, well, we're not, there's no chance of meeting this. Mm. And, you know, and for a number of reasons. Um, uh, quality coaching in, in other organizations can be about working with the developers and coaching them on how to write automated test cases but that's not something i've done mm -hmm. it, it's been more about process and upskilling skills in terms of uh making your testing visible yeah doing the planning communicating i think you know when i first started testing i really struggled to understand how why it was important to communicate to me about testing what you're doing because i thought it was just so obvious but as I've gotten older, I've realized that nothing is obvious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, in, in my current role, I almost, uh, I had to, because I was used, used to more working in startup teams, um, and you don't really have to worry too much about communication overhead. But if you go back into a, a larger corporate structure, you've got a lot more managers and a lot more leads who have opinions on how things should be done. And if you're not transparent in what you're doing, um, they have opinions on your uh, usefulness too. Oh yeah, uh, most recent project working for consultancy, um, there was at uni uh, university, there was a lot of stakeholders and they all had opinions. And even the BA had a constant opinion which he wasn't afraid of sharing. Um, and you know, that, <laughs> uh, and again, I probably underestimated how much effort I should have put into that, into talking about it and reinforcing it. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, it's yeah, it was hard not to get angry sometimes. But just shut up and listen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so when uh, dealing with uh, those types of situations, what tends to how do you find out who are the uh, people who just have um, just have loud opinions versus the people who actually have influence and. Uh, 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 yeah, some sort of power or, or yeah. say in yeah. how it's going to be done. Yeah, look, um, in my experience, it's um, my mistakes. 
all right so you know i'm thinking okay well i don't need to worry about you because you know you're blah 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 and then i hear their opinion coming through somebody i i, I am worried about and going oh yeah so for example uh, there's a ba who was very mouthy about what uh, how it should work and what we should be doing um i wasn't too concerned about her and then she started to kind of really influence um our technical smes or our business people mm. like, oh, right so now i need to go in and explain what what we're doing why we're doing it how this is going to work um and that was that was extra effort that i hadn't counted on um working with other our vendors they also seem to have uh, some opinion about uh, the way it should be run you know and if that was i didn't really understand where that was coming from um but they had definitely experience that i didn't have so i was trying to balance listening to that experience but still holding you know what i wanted to do so there's uh managing noise i guess from one angle but also managing good advice but understanding where that advice is coming from and how do you get to how did I get to you know I kind of struggled to get somewhere that was useful with that good advice from the vendor who had experience that I didn't have yeah hmm. so yep uh so in your new role can you um uh briefly describe the the team you'll be working with all oh, right um I will do my best but I don't really understand it myself yet <laughs> that, that's fine uh so a new company uh link group does um super fund administration and shareholder uh, registries so i thought this would be uh pretty insured against economic ups and downs but if you're a super fund and you're not making any money then you probably don't have any money to do projects <laughs> so that's why we kind of find ourselves in this current situation um from what i see so far i've got a team of about six or eight people um, I think I'm still working. I really haven't started to engage them yet, but uh, my responsibilities will be to work in that team and deliver certain projects. Um, we did have a consultant in working on test process, but that's now been handed over to me, which I'm quite excited about. Um, so they did have a previous test process, which seemed to have like four steps in it. And two of those seem to be business related testing. So my manager is saying that no, we're just going to do uh, system integration test which will include system tests and then we're going to have business verification test and then it'll be done so my job is to kind of document that process and also i think what hasn't been considered is how do we move from where we are to not even where we want to be but you know the next step to where we want to be mm. so this whole communication thing about right well this is what the team's used to doing this is what the business is used to doing we're not going to be doing that anymore we're going to be moving towards this how do we get the first step towards that so i think that will be the um, challenge to get everyone to agree. I think getting get everyone to agree about what we want to do is the easy part, but get everyone to agree about what's the next step towards moving that will be the harder part. So giving them, I talked to my manager about, oh, okay, so what tools do people have to um, move to this new way of working? And then he started to talk about um, Quality Center and JIRA, thinking, yeah, not what I'm thinking, the tools that we're going to need. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, I'm, I'm still stuck writing the occasional test case in Jira. Uh, uh, right. So uh, yeah, I've been testing for seven or yeah, seven years myself, and uh, uh, there's still an, an obsession with test cases. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, test case tools? Oh, um, if you are doing if you are doing the test case thing, then I think essential, um, an excellent way to show that. Uh, for traceability that you are you have got requirements traced down to uh, scenarios and test cases i'm a huge fan of scenarios and scenarios as a way to communicate your coverage mm. um don't talk to me about coverage in test cases no one can read that shit. it's it's too detailed um if you know what you're doing then you can turn your scenarios into test cases straight away i'm, I'm a fan of that um uh, i've seen quality center come up and come down again <laughs> mainly because it can't compete on cost, I don't think. I think the functionality is pretty good. Oh, and it seems to be stuck in a version of IE that came off the arc. So it's got a, a number of issues and I just don't think that product is gonna be around for in a couple of years time. It's just 
but far behind. Um, Jira and Zephyr is okay, but it, the good thing about Quality Center is that it's great, great at keeping a library of tests that's harder to find in, in Jira, I find. Mm. Yeah. But um, for the sort of testing I've been involved with, tracking test cases, test case execution, and traceability has been essential. And this is why I think a, a tool, tool is really good. If you're if you're much more flexible about the way you do testing and can do exploratory testing and just keep notes, screenshots where you need to, um, and then have some way of recording uh, traceability against what you've done, then I think that's fantastic. Um, at my previous project, I wasn't going to encourage user acceptance testing to be exploratory based. I think that's a great thing for UAT, oh, which is still something I can do at my new <laughs> new workplace. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you mind uh, just defining exploratory testing in, in your terms too, please? Oh, okay. Um, so when I first started testing, exploratory testing was something that was uh, random and ad hoc and kind of experimental, and something you kind of did at the end if you still had time and nothing else to do. But I think that's moved on quite substantially and there are a number of things uh, out and quite a bit of experience with exploratory testing now, which is much more structured. So I like Elizabeth Hendrickson's idea of a test charter, yep. um, where you give yourself some focus about what you're going to test and what you're going to use and what you're going to try and uh, find out. So it's much more focused on uh, time, the area of functionality and what you hope to discover. Um, and that this may also then trigger other exploratory tests. It's to use the tester's brain and skills to explore the software rather than doing step by step. If you're using business users and they're doing step by step, then why bother use why have business users if they're doing step by step? I think the value is for them to go, oh well normally I would do this and what about this over here? And and so those sort of human questions. Yeah, so it's a much more human approach to testing, I think. Mm. Yeah, there is uh, an assumption, I think, in the market that exploratory testing is just ad hoc testing, but uh, there's a lot of ways to incorporate risk or structure. Uh, and uh, the, the, the equation, well, equating test cases with, with testing is still a, an idea that hasn't died yet. Uh, no, and I don't think we'll be doing so anytime soon. Yes. Uh, but it is challenging to try and um, at least catch myself or other people from trying to use more nuanced terms as well. Yep. Yep. What other type of uh, debate do you find coming up in the uh, testing space in, uh, that's common across a lot of the teams you've worked in? Um. So uh, test planning, how much test planning is enough? So it looks like in this particular workplace, we're doing a test strategy for every project. I'm thinking, let's stop doing that straight away and just do test plans, scenarios, test cases, mm -hmm. maybe even work go from scenarios to, t to c test cases in one thing. Um, yeah, um, I guess this whole uh, and also what I've seen really struggle in previous workplaces where they were doing agile is trying to fit that really structured idea of testing into an agile way of working. It doesn't really work. Mm. Um, and I think this is probably where exploratory testing has got a lot of value, but you know, if you're writing, if you're doing some sort of web, web in or, you know, whatever application you're doing and you need certain drop down values or you need certain actions from certain decisions, you know, all that, all that combination needs to be done and that needs to be documented depending on your environment. So I think it's a, you know, what we're struggling with is how do I do it fast, but with quality? Mm. What, what the, what's the quality job when we do quality? I guess what's that's a, when you're doing a quality job. That's, yeah. that's a meta question. How do you measure the quality <laughs> of your quality? Oh, so uh, this, uh, so this current test team at the, the link group, we're going right. So defects in production apparently is a, is a thing. And uh, one of the huge measures is going to be reducing defect leakage to each stage up to production. Went great. So that's really something easy to measure. Yeah. Um, and I've also had discussions um, uh, a number of months ago, Anne-Marie Charrett ran a um, conference with quality coaches. And we talked about metrics for quality coaches, 
I'm saying, well, it has to be something that's uh, customer outcome based. But the more I've thought about that, I think your metric should be when you first start, it should be close to what you're changing. So if you're changing your process to reduce bugs to the next test phase, right, measure that. And then if you want to do something to reduce defects to production, great, measure that. And then when that's good, then move it up the scale a bit. If you start to measure something that's so far away from what you're doing, you may not be sure that what you're doing is actually affecting that. Mm. Yeah. So this is something I'm about to find out at Link Group. How effective can we be at removing defects if leaking into the next phase? Mm. I think there's, uh, I, I, I guess a lot of people tend to prioritise how uh, the the impact of, of bugs found in production. Uh, my, in my experience being on mobile teams is you're always going to have bugs in production because there's always going to be some sort of quirky Android system UI or, or there's just so much variation that you can't possibly test for everything for every little feature. Uh, and there's still going to be ways people are going to interact with your app that are going to produce bugs in production that you were like, wow, I just didn't expect that. Um, I think like trying to reduce the amount of high impact uh, bugs in production, uh, uh, you know, those uh, newsworthy bugs, the uh, <laughs> front page, front page of the paper yes. kind of bug. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah people do freak out about bugs in production, but you're right, Sam, how important is it? Mm. So, um, in, our, in finance organizations, it can often be about obviously lost money is a big deal. Uh, you know, I'm sure that your organization is focused on that. Um, if, and if your software is involved in call center operations, it can be about average handling time. Because when average handling time comes up, you need more people to answer the same number of phone calls. And this has a budget, you know, this has also got a financial impact. Mm. But if somebody can't use a, a function on the mobile app to do this, but can, you know, do it another way. Uh, yeah, no one's going to die. Chill out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I learned, sorry, you go. I learned, I learned a very interesting lesson at um, IAG. We got a defect in production during a batch process. Um, and this was particular, it caused, caused by a particular set of data that even if we'd run uh, the similar batch process in test, we probably wouldn't have found because we didn't have that data set. It was, captured and easily fixed and you know life went on mm -hmm. so you know you think oh my god it's a bug in production yeah but what was the impact how quickly could we fix it was anything else you know did we have to do any remediation mm -hmm. uh, yeah in yeah fact, the cost of finding that bug pre pre-production would have been enormous mm -hmm. and not worth it yeah there's, there's uh, one of those things that if you're looking at your software engineering practices and if you've, you've got effective monitoring in production so you can quickly pick up on these issues and if you have a, a streamlined deployment process, if you can fix your system within uh, a week or two uh, and reduce the amount of business impact, maybe you have to do some manual processing for a little while. Uh, that also uh, can influence, I guess, people's approach to testing at different stages as well too, right? Uh, yeah, I can't encourage monitoring and quick fixing enough because software testing is not going to be everything to all people at all times. Yeah, so having those, uh, I guess, uh, working on maturing your DevOps processes mm. so you can um, monitor and, and quickly uh, fix production when you do have these issues. I think that's that's vitally important. Mm. Uh, do you, in your new role, do you imagine you'll be getting involved with the hiring process? Probably. Ah, uh, not yet. Uh, maybe when the economy picks up. <laughs> yes. Um, what I uh, so I was hiring at uh, IAG, and we used a vendor there, and I found that doing scenario-based uh, interviews was quite good. So you know there was various behavior stuff and technical questions, but putting forward um, a requirement and asking testers, asking candidates to find if there are ambiguities. Um, I've got different, one of my favorite ones is related to dates yes. and, you know, something being valid for a month. So different people thought a month was uh, quite clearly defined. Other people thought it was always 30 days. Um, and then once they identify that, then kind of doing you know, boundary, finding boundary tests for that, for that. 
Um, and I find that, and then also asking them why, you know, why is that important? I've had interesting questions, answers about that. Um, also, uh, we had a vendor who was providing offshore services for us and getting involved in the hiring of those people I found very important. Just don't let them give you whoever they want to and making sure you talk to them, go through the same interview process and make, get an understanding of uh, what their abilities are. Um, also there, uh, you know, and that's just having a conversation actually, yeah, helps you understand their communication skills because if they're working offshore and m most of the team is going to be onshore, the communication skills are going to be essential. Mm. It, it's also one of those things that depending on the location of, uh, the offsite, uh, teams, um, the, the, the language and cultural differences as well can, can influence the communication tax that comes into yeah. bringing in those teams too. Yeah, yeah. And when I first started at IAG, we had a project that was using two or three offshore test resources, um, and they were meeting in a room and just using a desk phone to communicate. And it was getting, and quite clearly, I was, get, I was getting feedback from those guys that they really couldn't hear in meetings. So just organizing something as simple as a, a proper teleconference phone, and now they could hear and participate mm -hmm. and click and get better understanding. Yeah, even basic stuff. You know, uh, you know that just goes to show the organisation wasn't really set up with the, the tech required to do offshoring. Mm. Well, so I, I think yeah, yeah. Oh, you go. Oh, but uh, since kind of everyone's <laughs> moved to this, you know, working from home, but even just the uh, the technology that was put in to communicate, uh, you know, between different offices and with people working from home really helped of the offshore stuff as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I, I've seen some memes on the internet where it's like, who who has been driving the digital revolution in your company? It is like the CEO, the CTO or coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's definitely been a large focus on trying to support people from uh, working from home. Uh, what have been uh, your challenges working from home in the last week or two? Uh, all right, so I haven't really had any much experience of working from home. I lived in Redfern for 12, 13 years and the work has always been, you know, not very far away. Mm. So there's been no advantage. I haven't had much practice. So I was freaking out a bit that the fridge or the TV might start to talk to me a bit too much. <laughs> well, at least you don't have one of those smart fridges that are meant to talk to you or something, right? <laughs> but I've been surprised, you know, um, I closed this, uh, I'm lucky enough to have a two bedroom place where uh, my, my husband works in hospitality so he doesn't have a job um, so he's home but I just closed the study door um, and this has really allowed me to focus but still being able to you know get out and you know, have lunch with my husband for the first time in 20 years that's nice so there's been some advantages like that um, uh, focus I thought focus might be a bit of an issue but so far that's been okay um, I have found it difficult um, if people agree to like have a, a meeting they're not there I don't and their mobile number isn't on the directory you're kind of screwed mm. yeah there's no way to contact them there's you know you can't you can't stalk them at their desk yeah so it's been a, sometimes there's been a small accountability issue I guess but for me I've been surprised that actually it's working quite well um, but onboarding but clearly that's just it's just going to be slower and I just have to accept that it's going to be slower mm. Yeah, it's also going to be, uh, I imagine, uh, well, if I had to start work with a new team next week, uh, some of the challenges I think I would have is just trying to build up that rapport with the people you're trying to work more closely with. It, it's hard to build rapport with people over uh, digital means. Oh, uh, yeah, I would agree. So, you know, first of all, I, you know, uh, hello, I'm the new boy. Can you talk to me? Uh, I've got other things to do. <laughs> Yeah, and some of the response. Yeah, and that you can't even do the hey, we've had someone new join. We're going to go out for a team lunch. Yeah, there's none of that. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, so, yes. or even talk to people randomly in the kitchen. Yes. So those kind of um, incidental social engagements just aren't there, you know. And so sometimes you can actually exchange relevant. You might start off as a social thing, and then you you kind of go, oh, what do you do? Oh, right. Well, I'm doing something about that too, and. You kind of find something you're working on together. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, so that, that, that. <laughs> yeah, that, that incidental uh, um, getting to know people in the company you're working with is a lot harder online too. Yeah, it's a lot harder. Yeah. Mm. How long do you reckon your team will be working from home or focusing on that? Yeah, Sam, I don't know. Nobody knows, do they? So they're saying that the curve is flattening, but and but I'm also hearing that, well, it won't be till there's a vaccine that actually we're on the other side. So they're saying a vaccine's 12, 18 months away. I look, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be at least six months that we're going to be in this situation. Mm. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm perceiving that it's going to be after after our peak flu season because we may yeah. be reducing the numbers now, but if we go back to regular habits, this virus is still floating around and it's really hard to prevent the spread of. So I reckon we're going to be cautious and careful at least until peak flu season is is over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's it's work from home. It's it's just basically at home for the next six months. Well, the, the, the current in New South Wales, or at least here in Sydney, uh, the, the current uh, social uh, isolation law, which was introduced on Tuesday just a few days ago, it's weird to think that it was just a few days ago, is uh, meant to be in effect for 90 days. So until the 29th of June is when current social laws will uplift, hopefully. All uh, right, unless they extend it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or shorten it, but uh, yeah. but considering it feels like they've just rushed these laws through, we're stuck with them for a while, I think. Uh, yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, or, so, or your team is the whole of Commonwealth Bank working from home? Uh, we're trying to uh, do all of C. If you're a non-essential, if you're not working from a branch. If you're oh, mostly right. yep. in IT, you should be trying to work from home wherever possible. Um, the re general recommendation is don't come into the office if you don't need to. Um, right. I need to do, like, I'm going into the office maybe one or two days a week um, to do more integrated test environment testing because that's very challenging to do with the current uh, CBA remote uh, tools. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing a little bit in the office, but I am trying to do as much as I can from, from home. And um, the, the company's uh, expanded a lot of their remote uh, VPN technology as well. That's been, it's been a huge challenge just trying to get through that. Uh, just last week we were told, uh, don't use the remote VPN uh, if you're a, if, unless you've gotten an email from the head honcho person. <laughs> uh, you can only use the remote stuff uh, outside of the hours 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So last week I was basically trying to work from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. just for a little bit. All oh, right. Uh, why aren't you supposed to use the VPN? Uh, yes, but because I wasn't deemed uh, essential, I wasn't allowed to use it during oh, uh, right, peak because okay. it only had so much uh, yeah. capacity bandwidth. Right. And they increased it from 5,000 to, to 15,000 um, concurrent connections, but the bank has 55,000 employees. Yeah. So <laughs> it's still way short. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're, they're still investing in uh, improving that technology, and we, it should be better next week. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, has there been, you know, in my, my workplace where they've kind of had to kind of contractors are terminated and so on. Has there been anything like that at CBA? No. Not in, not in my team. Right. Uh, but the, the generally over the last six months has been a trend where uh, contractors aren't the flavour of the month. Um, so this has been, a, we're being, um, instead of, we're just been transitioning contractor roles, particularly in the testing space, into more full-time positions. Oh, okay. Mm. So right. there's, there's been uh, a bit of that. But we do have... Um, uh, we have offshore support teams, um, but we recently migrated uh, from using a team in India to a team in Manila uh, because there's less uh, time zone difference um, and, I don't know, corporate partnership. All right. <laughs> um, so uh, do you have any advice for anyone who's working from home uh, and trying to stay healthy or uh, sane 
Oh. <laughs> so what's working what's working for me is still so whatever structure I had at the office, I'm still having at home. So that means starting at the same time, I'm having morning coffee at the same time, I'm having lunch at about the same time and finishing at the same time. Um, and then getting up, getting out of the house and going for a walk or whatever your exercise used to be. I used to swim a lot. Of course, that's finished. So I'm just walking, but I'm just trying to find, I'm going, oh, what else, what else is out there that's kind of a bit more strenuous than walking? Um, and I'm not a huge kind of fan of running, but maybe that might be in my future. I'm not sure. I've seen a lot of cyclists today in North Sydney. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. It's a good idea. Mm, there's um, probably lots of sales of bikes at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, so so finding a routine or finding something that works. Um, my yoga teacher was suggesting, you know, mate, you could do a bit of yoga every morning. I went, well, oh. so I've been doing a bit of that. That's really helped. Um, I've forgotten. Oh God, I'm so. I think sitting. Of course, there's a lot more sitting down. There's mm -hmm. not even walking to and from the train train anymore. Even you know, walking to the office. So, um, getting up and getting active, I think, is very important. But you know, for me. Yep. So finding some act activity that you can you can do. Cool. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good note to uh, potentially end the interview with. I'm just checking the Twitch chat. It doesn't seem like we've got any questions in the in the live stream. I think it's um, well. This is the first time I've really tried to to live stream from eleven o'clock. So I think I don't have the uh, if most of my audience is in Australia, eleven a.m might not be the best uh the best streaming time maybe not yeah but uh thanks for the conversation today i will um uh upload this onto to youtube at some point um is there any other remarks you'd like to leave any of our watchers with <laughs> no thanks so much sam cool thank you all right bye-bye